This is just you for yourself. There's no test, there's no examination. It's just, how do I feel now? One word answer. Yes? Light. Light. Anybody else like to offer an answer? Calm. Calm. There's no right or wrong. You might feel stressed. I don't know how, but you might. <laughs> you might feel tired, sleepy, lazy, boring. You might feel energized, excited, refreshed. Refreshed? Stable. Stable. Safe. Huh? Safe. Safe. I like it. Does anybody else feel safe? Put your hand up if you don't feel safe. <laughs> Put your hand up if you feel happy. A lot of you just laughed at that, so you were happy. But notice how quickly happiness disappears. You laugh, ha ha ha, it's gone. Now how do you feel? Actually, in the last minute, you've experienced maybe four or five different emotions. Just like that. Curious, happy, interested, amused, and pew, pew, they go, they disappear just even in a minute, a few minutes. How do you feel now? Some of you are nervous because you're thinking about the answer and you're thinking, will I say it out loud in a group of people? Were you aware of that feeling? Now your mind's changing again. Now you're a little bit more self-conscious. Ah, oh, should I say something? Should I not say something? Is it okay? Am I safe? And then some of you find that amusing, some of you find that a little bit... You see how the emotions are coming up and down, they're coming in and out. They're all like on sliding scales, it's almost like a, like a DJ or, you know, the sound operators, they've got these big boards with these sliding scales and they push this up and pull that down and our emotions are doing this. So it doesn't matter how you feel, but it matters that you know how you feel, that you are aware of how you feel. So you could feel nervous, you could feel angry, you could, could feel bored or whatever, it doesn't matter, but as long as you know that's how I feel and you're honest with yourself. Ah, huh, I feel a bit, I feel a bit tense. I feel a bit um, disturbed or nervous. It's okay. Remind yourself it's okay to feel that now and also remind yourself this is passing. This is passing. That is anicca. Anicca in the Buddha's language, Pali. It's passing. This is impermanent. Even you feel happy. We all just had a little laugh a couple of times. Did you see how quickly it came and went? It's like you go, <laughs> it's gone. It's like the mind goes, yeah, well, it's gone. Now what? Now how do you feel? Oh, curious, interested. Impermanent. Impermanent mental states. How many thoughts did you have while you were laying down? Some of you don't know because you were asleep. And that's okay. I said that a few times. You, you're going to fall asleep because you're tired. It's normal, it's natural. But I, again, like I said at the beginning today, I also wanted you to relax here today. No need to come to a retreat 
meditation retreat and feel stressed like oh I have to sit and I have, I'm not allowed to move and you know I got pain and you know I have to control my mind and I have to fix this and oh I've got so many things going on that's not meditation it never was meditation and it never will be meditation the actual real state of meditation is when the mind becomes silent and you're in a pure experience and that experience could be anything it could be hearing could be smelling could be tasting it could be just watching a, a mental state even like peace or even safe or calm, or clear, or as I've been suggesting, space, or silence, or stillness. When your mind is just on those experiences, the mind becomes very quiet. And now you are entering into a meditative state. Until then, you're just practicing. You're following a technique, you're trying to do something. That's why I reminded you a while ago, don't try too hard to do this because the more you try to do it, you won't be able to do it because you're in the act of trying. So really what this is about is surrendering. This is interesting. This is something that my teachers didn't teach this. My Theravada Buddhist teachers. But I learnt it from a guy that I used to listen to on the internet called Adhyashanti. So he's not Theravadan, but he is Buddhist. He comes from Zen tradition, but then he also practices something like Advaita or uh, non dual practice, which is also very aligned with Buddhism. It doesn't really matter, but one of, his, one of his sayings is resistance is futile. Resistance is futile. Futile here means a waste of time, waste of energy. Trying to resist things is only going to make you tired and it's just going to go on and on and on and on. And I found in my practice that a lot of what I thought was meditation was actually resistance. And somebody who feels perfectionism or is a kind of perfectionist, although you feel like you're trying to perfect things and make things perfect, simultaneously you're resisting everything that's not perfect. So you're pushing away many experiences trying to get a perfect experience. You're trying to be a perfect meditator. You're trying to get the meditation perfect. You're trying to do it right. For what reason? I want to impress my teacher. I want to impress my parents. I want to impress anybody, society, Instagram, whoever it is. Or I just want to impress myself. This is the life of a perfectionist constantly trying to prove themselves to someone, someone out there, something out there, or even just themselves. Do you realize that it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter if anybody approves of you or doesn't approve of you. It, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. But if you can accept yourself as you really are, this is also one of the first steps in metta, loving-kindness towards yourself. You have to learn how to accept yourself as you are. Not just love yourself, because there are a lot of people doing metta and they're saying, may I be safe, peaceful and healthy, you know, may I be free from inner and outer harm, may I blah, 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 blah. And they're doing lovely metta and they're doing it even for themselves, but it's a lot of words. Occasionally they'll get some nice fuzzy warm feeling from it. But actually, one of the most important practices is to relax, to be aware, and to accept. Accept 
whatever it is that's happening here and now in your body and mind, no matter what it is. And when you can accept it and allow it to be present, actually everything's all right. Even your pains, your itchiness, your, you know, whatever's happening in the body, maybe you're sitting under the air con and it gets too cold. When you're resisting the cold and saying, oh, it's cold, I should have put my jacket on, oh, he told us to sit still, oh, I'm going to get cold, I'm going to get sick, oh, I'm going to die. <laughs> cold is just cold. When you allow yourself to experience cold, nothing will happen. Nothing's going wrong. Your body is an amazingly amazing, adaptable organism. It can withstand the cold. It can withstand the heat. It can withstand many things if you allow it and you trust it and you believe in it. But when you resist, you're actually causing more trouble. You're, co you're doubling your dukkha, is what I say. We already have dukkha, something's unpleasant, and then we resist it, we fight with it, and we double our dukkha. And almost everybody is doing this. So what I learned through this practice, by sitting still, was that the longer I sit still, the more experiences that would come to me. And yes, they're unpleasant, but the more I allow them to be present, the more they come and go, and the more I understood, actually, theoretically, I could just sit here in this stillness pretty much forever. And you've seen on, on the internet, and you've heard reports, there are people who just sit and sit and sit and sit, even for days and weeks. What was the Buddha boy or something? They, I don't know if it's real or not, but... Even they put cameras on him, he sat and sat and sat and sat and sat. There are yogis who sit for days and weeks. They don't go to the toilet, they don't drink water, they don't move, they don't have to scratch or, you know, take the bugs out of their ears or their nose or whatever happens. You don't have to do that. But if you do start to sit perfectly still, like a Buddha, five minutes. Go for 10 minutes, go for 15 minutes, then the numbness starts after 10 or 15 minutes. Then you start shaking and... Watch your mind. How's that? How do I feel now? What's happening in the body? What's happening in the mind? How do I feel? Observe that. You'll find that this numbness is just vibration and it's coming and going. And then you watch your mind, what is this? Is it resistance? Yes, it's resistance for sure. Is it impatience? Are you afraid? Are you worried? What, what are you afraid of? Do you think your foot's going to fall off? Do you think you're going to be crippled for life? How many thousands, not thousands, thousands of millions of people have sit, sat in this position since, I don't know, since meditation was invented? uncountable people have sat in this position for very long periods of time and when they're finished they get up and they walk away because there's no problem. I would like to facilitate you learning a little bit from each other. So would anyone like to give me a short a uh, brief feedback about what you experienced when eating mindfully. Or, even if you can, between here and the lower floor, did anybody walk mindfully? Did anybody feel awareness on the stairs? And it's not a test, it's not an examination, I'm not checking up on anybody. I'm just wondering, did anything that I say impact you in a way that you had a new experience or something that you could share that then might inspire other 
friends. Anything on the way to the meal? <laughs> okay, I walked on the stairs mindfully. I took it a little bit slowly because I asked you to do it. I had to do it, right? So this is why I like teaching, actually. Because if I tell you to do something, I have to do it also. So I'm actually practicing. I realize that on a retreat, I'm the one who gets the best experiences. I'm the one who learns the most on the retreat. One, because I've been training myself how to learn for 30 years. And secondly, um, I'm actually practicing and doing what I'm asking everybody else to do. I'm not blowing my own horn here, but you will find that a lot of teachers on retreats don't do what, they ask, what they've asked you to do. They'll tell you all to do a certain thing, and then they'll go off and have a coffee and read the newspaper or go sightseeing or you know, read a book or do something else. And that's cool. That's, that's up to them. That's, that's their style. But I feel that if I'm asking you to do a particular practice, then I need to do that too. Of course, sometimes I go, I'm conducting interviews and I'm talking with people, so that's a different thing. That's part of the, the teaching. So I did walk down the stairs slowly and not so slowly, but mindfully, and um, it's refreshing. I still like to do that even myself. I've done it for many years now, and it's still a refreshing practice because you get out of your head and you just, you're just in the experience of stepping. And even then, it doesn't matter where you're going. Like you could be walking down the, I don't know, one of the um, KLCC towers or something and walking down the stairs in there is going to take you a really long time. But it doesn't matter how far you're going or how many stairs there are. It's just this step, this step, one step at a time. And you're just in this moment in this step, and then it doesn't matter how far you've come, it doesn't matter how far you're going. And I, I learned this when I was in Japan. Actually, I learned it before then, but I practiced it. These guys took, I was on a retreat, leading a retreat, and they said, would you like to go for a walk in the afternoon? I said, yes. So we went out for a walk. They said, oh, you like walking? I said, yes. They said, oh, um, would you like to go up a hill and do some walk? I said, yes. So the next day, they took, us, took me to what looked like a small volcano. It was a volcanic plug, and it was, the sides were like that. And so we started walking up. The trees were, were like growing kind of sideways out of this thing. Anyway, it, it, got, it was just steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper. And we were climbing and it wasn't walking, it was climbing, it was unbelievable actually. And I'm an unfit monk at that time, you know, I was just, oh, I didn't do any workout or walking or anything. Anyway, I applied this principle of stepping and breathing and stepping and breathing. And when I forget about how far I've come and I forget about how far I have to go, I'm only taking this step now. And so I got to the top and they were exhausted. They were like, <laughs> and sitting down, I thought, don't sit down, just keep walking. Keep the body moving. Because that's also one of my theories is that don't stop. Just keep going, just keep going, just keep going. Because if you think I'm tired, then you're going to be tired. If you think, oh, I came so far, then you're going to be tired. So. I kept walking around and they were looking at me and they said, wow, you're so fit. I was like, I'm not fit. <laughs> and they said, oh, um, they said, how did you, like, how do you do that? That you can walk up the hill and still not be tired. I said, well, I'm using mindfulness. I'm watching my breath. I synchronize my breath and my step and I stop thinking about how far it is, etc., etc." And then they just, then they admitted to me, they are mountaineers. They are mountain climbers. That's what they do for their, like their hobby. And they travel to different parts of the world or even in Japan and they climb mountains. So I just climbed this small mountain with them 
and they're all exhausted and tired, and I'm just, I'm still walking. So what I learned was that, and I've just already shared it with you a couple of times, is just be in this step in the moment. Don't worry about how far you've come or how far you have to go. It's like, can you just take one step? Yes, okay, take one step. Can you take one step? Take one step. Take one step. Take one step. If you want to climb up a mountain, it's only one step, and then one step, and one step, and one step. The only number that actually exists is one. The other one is zero, and it's not technically a number. So there's only ones and zeros in this world. It's getting off the track. Yes? So by the time you've reached up, you, you still were tired? I, I wasn't tired, no. And I've done this many times, even when I was a monk and I was technically unfit. But what I do is I just, it's like I go, it's not a trance, but it's just like you're just stepping and breathing and stepping and breathing and stepping and breathing. And this is where I started to tell myself, my body's a machine and it just does what I tell it to do. But if I start thinking, oh, I'm tired, then I become tired. If I think about how far I've come, I get tired. If I think how far I've got to go, I'm tired. But if I just take this step, this step, now, now, breathing, breathing, I'm not thinking. When I'm not thinking, I'm not tired. I did this with swimming. I taught myself I was not a, I was a wild swimmer. I grew up at the beach, so I'm a, I'm a surfer, and I, I swim in waves, and, you know, it's dynamic, and you have to be, you know, really, really aware, and it's, it's very changing surfing, swimming in the surf. So I started swimming in a swimming pool and I taught myself to do laps. Before I thought doing laps in a pool is so boring, you know? So I swim down there, turn around, swim back, turn around, swim back. But after I'd learnt meditation, walking meditation, walk over there, walk back, walk over there, walk back, walk over there, I can do swimming meditation. So I did swimming meditation. And I taught myself how to breathe properly and how to kick my little legs and how to do a little tumble roll at the, each end. And then, so I did, I taught myself, I did 10 laps of a 50 meter pool, I did 20 laps, then I did 30 laps, and then I did, I think I jumped from 30 laps to 50 laps, and then I did 50 laps, and then I did 60 laps, and then I did 70 laps, and then I jumped, and then I went to 80 laps of a, of a 50 meter pool, 80 laps is already four kilometers. It's well over an hour of constant swimming without stopping. So all you're doing is you're breathing and swimming and breathing and swimming and breathing and swimming. And technically, the body will keep doing it as long as you tell it to keep doing it. But if you're thinking, oh, it's 80 already, oh, I can't do 80, 80 is too far. So I went to 80 and Every time I would ask myself, so last week I did 10, so this week I get to 10, I do 9, 9.9, .9, and then I say, I check my body, am I okay? Is the body okay? Yeah, body's okay. How's your mind? Mind's okay. Okay, keep going. So I do 20. Next week I get to 19.9 .9 laps, I'm about to finish, and I say, how's the body? Is it okay? Body's okay. Mind's okay. Okay, keep going. So I did 30. Then I get to 29, and I say, how's the body? Body's okay, mind's okay, and I keep going. And I think, why stop? The body, it doesn't have to stop. If your mind's good and your body's good, you don't have to stop. So I got to 80, and I was doing 79.9, .9, and I said, is the body okay? Body's okay, mind's okay, okay, keep going. I got to 90, no, 89, and I said, how am I going? I said, body's okay, mind's okay. Keep going. So I jump from 80 laps to 100 laps. It's five kilometers. It's an hour and 40 minutes of constant swimming. Look at the size of me. I'm a little guy, you know. I'm not some, you know, huge muscle man or something like that. But it's mind over matter. So, and I'll give you another quick little uh, simile. I found that there's a bird near my local beach in Australia and that bird there's a sign at the beach and it says this bird lives here and it eats these things but it uh, it doesn't live here it lives in New Zealand 
And I was like, hey, there's a bird, it's here, but it lives in New Zealand. And it says it comes over here, it feeds or does something, and then it goes back to New Zealand to, for mating season or something. And I'm like, New Zealand is 2,000 kilometres over the ocean. There's nowhere to stop. The bird's only this big. How does this little bird fly non-stop to New Zealand, 2,000 kilometres, no food, no water, so one day it gets up, it has its breakfast, this much food, eats its breakfast and then starts flying and doesn't stop flying for three days. Where's the energy come from? Where's this bird? It's got no, it's got no fat. It's, it's not, you know, muscle. It's just this skinny little bird. And it flies for three days nonstop. Can you do that? Maybe you can. If you want to, maybe, of course, you don't want to. But what this taught me was that we have an intrinsic power and energy that we can draw on that just keeps going and going and going. And you see people, they break records in the world all the time. And sometimes you look at these people and you think, oh, they're so skinny, they're so small, or, you know, how do they possibly do that? It's because they're doing it with their mind, not with their body. So when you tell yourself, so another quick thing before we get back to my point, um, be aware that you are telling yourself that you are tired. All your life, you have been telling yourself that you're tired. Your parents started telling you when you were young, and then you picked it up and you started telling yourself. And in your society and amongst your friends and everybody around you, everybody's saying how tired they are. And so you believe that you're tired. Even today, you came here, I told you, you're tired. It's true that you're tired, but you're tired because you believe you're tired. And you tell yourself that you're tired. Actually, I reversed this by saying, I am energy. Why would I say I'm energy? Because it's the truth. This physical body and all the cells, the, the, the atoms, the protons, the neutrons, whatever, all these things that make up this body are all forms of energy. This body is completely energy. What's the mind? Mind is mental energy. They've measured the, the energy that comes from thoughts, even from the brain, but also from the body. Thoughts can be measured. Emotions can be measured. They are also energy. We are mental and physical energy. We are, in fact, power units. So, if you start telling yourself, I am energy, I am energy, I am energy, then you will be energy. If you keep telling yourself, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired, then you will be tired. And if you think that it all depends on how much food you ate, you say, oh, I didn't eat enough food, I'm tired. Or I didn't get enough sleep, oh, I'm tired. Or I've worked too much, I'm tired. You will make up all the excuses in the world why you're tired. Why do you want to be tired? So you can have a sleep and just lay down and do nothing. Well, then maybe you're lazy or maybe you've got nothing to do. Maybe you're not creative enough to actually decide what you really want to do with your life. You notice people out there in the world, they're full of energy and they're just like pumping away and just going and going and going. Some of them are a little bit obsessed, which is probably not very healthy, but some of them just love what they do. They're so passionate about what they do, they don't even think about eating. They don't have to sleep because they're so passionate and they just keep going. It's like kids. When kids get together with their friends, they just, they run, they play, they scream, they shout, they cry, they do everything. They forget to eat. They forget to go to the toilet. Their parents are saying, come here, come and eat something. They're like, um, and then they run back and they, they're going again. So we are energy. Please remind yourself. 
I am energy. I am energy. I am energy. I am energy. My mind is energy. My body is energy. Energy comes from the universe, not just from what you eat or how much sleep you do or how much rest you have or the amount of work you do or don't do. You are energy. If you keep reminding yourself of this, then you'll be able to do whatever you want to do. Question? Yes, I have a question. Okay, say like um, you had... So, I usually believe that after I do a lot of work, I feel tired, but that's not the case. <laughs> You do feel tired, and you might feel tired in your, in your body if you work hard physically, or you do a workout, or play some sport, you will feel Not something. Like, as in like, let's say, I do a lot of drawing, I do a lot of drawings for, um, it's like your work. Yeah, for my work, it's like, I have to, I make animation basically, so there's a lot of drawings to be done, mm. uh, there's a lot and lots of frames, a lot of work to be done. So, usually by the end of it, I feel quite tired. Mm. And after maybe many days of doing this, I will feel demotivated. Mm. But yeah, how would I not feel demotivated? And how would I not feel tired? Okay, so, um, but you can do it for long periods of time because you enjoy it, right? Yeah, okay. So you just need to remind yourself to take a few more breaks. That's all. Because you do love what you're doing, I assume. Yeah? And you must be pretty good at it. Yeah? yeah? Say, yeah, I am. Good. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, own your stuff. If you're good at something, say, I'm good at this. It doesn't matter. Other people, you're actually inspiring other people when you say, I'm good at this. I love this, and I like doing it, and I'm actually good at it. This is what I do. This is the work that I do. And although I'm not the best at it, I'm not saying that, I like it, and I, I think I'm pretty good at it. So it's just, you take ownership. So that's one thing. The other thing is, so sometimes a people can get too absorbed into what they're doing, and they forget to take a break, like the kids that are too busy playing, and they forget to take a break. So you just need to maybe set a little timer or something and remind yourself, take a break, drag yourself away from it, or finish what you need to do, have a break and come back and then you'll find that you have more energy. Even do a little lying meditation like we did just now, like a 10 minute lying meditation, set your timer. That'll also refresh your mind and refresh, it'll completely reset yourself. So those of you who work hard every day, even mothers, busy mothers or whoever, do a, do a 10 minute lying meditation, set your alarm and get back up, you'll feel fresh and ready to go. Okay, so what I consider as like um, you're, you actually need to take a break or you are just conditioning your mind to feel tired? Because like for example, you said like you didn't need to like take a break at all because if you stop, you feel, you, you, if you look back at what you've done or something, you feel tired or for example, the bird, you keep going for three days without stopping. So what I consider as an actual feeling like you need to take a break or what I consider as you can just keep going if you draw the energy <laughs> yeah theoretically we could keep going but of course there is we do have our physical limits so that's why i started talking about the physical body if you work out you get tired or are you doing work you will feel a physical tiredness you can also feel a mental tiredness especially sometimes you feel a bit blurry or you know you're losing your losing your awareness losing your concentration so there are signs that are telling you that you do need to take a break. But what I suggest is that before you get to that exhaustion point, take a conscious break. So that you take a break and then you can come back and you can go even longer. And then before you get exhausted, take a break and then come back and do it again. If you push yourself until you become exhausted, then you will feel demotivated and you won't enjoy your work so much. So it's really, there's some mindfulness and wisdom needs to be applied. Mm. You okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm just still Thanks. a bit confused how, how the like drawing that un unlimited energy works <laughs> from your body. Mm. Um, you have to start practicing it. 
So it's easy for me, it's not easy for me to sit here and explain it. I can explain it, but it's about you noticing your own limits, noticing your own energy levels, noticing when your energy is very high and maybe bringing it down a little bit, noticing when your energy is too low and bringing it up a little bit so that you have more energy which lasts longer. It's not easy for me to explain it right here and now, but briefly, it's like that. Before your energy gets too high, then level it down a little bit. Before your energy gets too low, bring it up a little bit so that you're not hitting highs and lows. If you get too high, of course you're going to crash and that's what's happening. You're using all your energy and then you get um, exhausted and then you feel demotivated. So before you get to that level, just round it off and come back to a middle way. Before you get too low, bring yourself up and come back to the middle way. The Buddha's teaching is called the middle way. And I believe this is also not going to extremes, not too high, not too low, not too right, not too left. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. It's about energy management as well. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. So, any comments about eating mindfully? What did you see? What did you feel? Anything? Basically, one thing I realized is that my hand is almost automated. Even when I try to tell it not to move to get the next bite, it will go on it by itself. And before I know it, there's another spoon right in front of me without me even thinking. So I have to, sometimes I have to actually like really put my hand down and actively tell it to not move yeah. so that I could like readjust myself to this slower pace of eating. Yeah. That's something I realized. Um, uh, kind of a, I guess, not really a good habit. I'm not doing it consciously. It's something that has kind of been ingrained into my, to my, my basically body movements. It's not something I do consciously. Mm. So that's just something I realized about it. Beautiful. Yep. Great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The guy behind you. Yeah. At the beginning, uh, I tried to collect the, the pack of the foods. Then I just have a look uh, whether it's vegetarian or not. But actually, I can't actually capture whole the whole whole food. Then I forgot already. Then after that, you mentioned again, you know, the mushroom, whatever. Then I just recall. Eh, actually, the mind didn't capture. The mind is in some sort of like diluted way, or or in certain kind of thinking. It just accept what it is and but it's still going somewhere else yeah and then after that um i do know uh my stomach is not feeling well so i take up some of the rice because i couldn't finish off so this is one of the feedback for my body so i take up some of the rice uh, and then i take some curry then after that uh you start to mention about how we should go for about it then the step, um, the truth, to paste on the mouth, closing the eyes. Then I choose the most. Uh, this is, is the vegetable. <laughs> I try to bite, and then normally vegetable is a lot of fiber, so the texture, you know, the mind can recognize it is vegetable, <laughs> and surprisingly, it got some sweetness, so the mice nice like the uh the sweetness of the the veggie yeah good yeah okay yeah yeah the most important thing when you're eating is to see how your mind works it's not so much about what am i eating or how good is it or what the quality of it is it's more about how does my mind react to what i'm eating so this is and how your mind is, whether your mind is present or not present. So to notice when your mind wanders off. Did you notice how many times your mind went off to la la land and was doing la la things somewhere? And, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, I'm, I'm actually in the basement of BGF eating my, eating my lunch. It's quite amazing, isn't it? How far your mind can go and you completely don't know that you're eating. You don't know anything that's happening about the present moment 
even there's all these people sitting around you eating, everything's going on, but you are completely lost in your, in your little thought, whether it was a fantasy or a memory or something else, some plan. And that's perfectly fine. That's how the mind works. And allow yourself to accept that's how the mind works. That's what it does. And it's important to see how lost you can be and how it feels then to come fully back and actually taste this, this mushroom in your mouth or feel the texture of the tofu or the sweetness of the, of the gravy or the actual grains of the rice and really have the experience of this mouthful of food in this moment. Anybody else have some quick, some little thing that you realized or that you found helpful, useful, curious? Just now what inspired me was the I am the energy phrase that we tell ourselves when we want to do something. So I realized that in my life there are certain aspects that I can do this kind of thing. For example, in my work, but there are also certain things that um, when it comes something like my weak point, when I tell I am the energy of it, but I couldn't do it. Mm. So can you give us some advice? Can, can you give me some advice on this? Yeah, sure. You know, when we say it's a weak point, then actually that's the point where you need to investigate and ask yourself, why is this a weak point? You know, you might have a friend and it's their strong point, but in you, it's a weak point. Why is it a weak point in you? Where does it come from? Does it come from your family? Does it come from something that happened in your childhood? So it's, it could be a little bit psychological, um, but it could also be not that it's a weak point, but maybe it's something that you're just not interested in or something that you don't really like or something. So there, in the Buddha's teachings, there are these five mental faculties. So there is sadha, virya, sati, samadhi, panya. So sadha is faith or confidence, I call it. Even we could call it interest. The second is virya, which means effort or energy. Sati is mindfulness, samadhi is concentration, and panya is wisdom. When I'm interested in something, even curious about something, or I feel confident in something, or I just have faith in something, then it gives me energy. So I go for that thing, I go towards that thing, and I'm interested in it, and I have energy for it. When I have energy, I have more mindfulness, which means I'm more switched on, I'm paying attention. When I pay attention, I can concentrate, I can zoom in. When I zoom in, I get insight. I get some realization, I understand something more clearly, or I can learn from it. So then when I've learned something, it also gives me inspiration, and I have more faith, I have more confidence, which gives me more energy, more mindfulness, more concentration, which gives me more insight. And so this is a wheel of actually cause and effect. When you have that, that confidence, or that interest, or that, that faith, faith in yourself or faith in a, in a process. My teachers used to always talk about faith in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha or faith in the meditation technique. Then you'll practice and you'll, you'll get these experiences, these better experiences. But it also applies to life. But it also applies in the negative. If I'm not interested in something, then I'm not going to have any energy. If I haven't got energy, I'm not going to pay attention. If I don't pay attention, I'm not going to concentrate. And if I don't concentrate, I can't learn anything. It's very simple. And so I just, I, I, I retract, I pull away from something. So when I was at school, for example, things that they were teaching me, to me, were just boring. I wasn't interested. Like mathematics, to me, it's like, you know, you're all in your head. What, what, <laughs> let's go out and play football or let's you know, go and do something, you know. Why are we just doing stuff in our head? Okay, I need to count. I need to pay money for things. I need to make some transactions or something like that. But why we have to just study something mental, you know. 
how about overturning bad habits? Because these are the certain interests and passion about work, about life. But how about fundamental habits in our life? Overturning it. Like what? Mm, for example, our exercising habit, our diet habit, our mm. sleeping habit. Yeah. These kind of fundamental habits. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's just laziness. Sometimes it's because we haven't yet got the wisdom how good that is for us. Intellectually, I might know that going and working out at the gym or doing, going for a walk every morning or even putting my feet on the earth every day, I might intellectually know, oh, that's a good idea. I should do that. But maybe I haven't yet got the full experience, the wisdom that actually inspires me to do it every day. And that's the difference that you'll find when people are very passionate about something, it's because they've really got the wisdom of it. They've really experienced it and they know how good it is for them. Even like myself, you can see me sitting here, I'm quite passionate about, about what I'm talking about. It's because I've actually experienced this and I know how good it is for me, so I know it's actually going to be good for you as well. And the same with anybody else, you know, they might be, it might be their traditional Chinese medicine or something that they're so motivated about because they know how good it is and how much it works. So sometimes you have to, you do have to push yourself a little bit to do the things that you know are good for you, even though you haven't yet quite got the full experience yet, but, um, and the other thing is to mix it up a little bit and diversify. So do something, um, something similar to what you do, but do it in a different way. Uh, for example, you might like, like, for example, working out, you might, you're going to the gym, but there's something about going to the gym that puts you off. Okay, we'll go swimming or go cycling or do something else that works out your body and don't just go gym, 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 gym every day of the week and then make yourself bored and, you know, frustrated with going to the gym to the point where you go, I don't want to go to the gym anymore. I'm sick of going to the gym. It's because you're pushing yourself and forcing yourself. But if you mix it up and do some other things, go swimming one day, go to the gym one day, play tennis another day, go cycling one day, something like that, mix it up and you feel more inspired, more um, motivated. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's one of the things. They say um, variety is the spice of life. Yeah. So you just create varieties or even bring, bring another buddy to a gym or go to another gym or, you know, go to some of the sessions at the gym instead of just working out on the weights, go to the, um, go to one of the classes or something or try some different aspect of the gym, try doing the weights instead of the machines or the, you know, other things like that. So again, variety it up, mix it up a bit and maybe change your routine. If you always do the gym this way, then try doing the gym that way or, um, yeah, things like that. It's about spicing it up, mixing it up, changing it around. Then the mind's more, more interested. If you're just doing the same thing all the time, even though it's good for you, you're going to get bored with it. You're welcome. Oh, thank you. And get a girlfriend in the gym, that, that's the motivation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, just out of uh, curiosity, that what made you choose this path? <laughs> it's funny because the answer that I've been using lately is um, this path cho chose me. So I believe in karma. The Buddha was teaching karma. And karma in many other cultures, they call it destiny or fate. Uh, there's another word there somewhere, I can't quite get it. Um, it's like predestined. That, that, uh, and some other religions will say it's already written. That all we're doing is we're just acting out the play or the movie or the book or something like that. So in Buddhism, we don't believe this. We believe that we still have some, uh, we still have free will to make a decision and we have intention, we have volition. And the Buddha said that this intention and this volition is karma. This is actually your karma and you're doing it in every moment. Now I'm doing it 
by choosing these words, by choosing to speak, by choosing to do this actual act that I'm doing now. But in the past, I had made decisions which led me to a point in this life where I woke up and it was one of the things was I did wake up before that retreat that I told you where the teacher said the future doesn't exist. So I had already woken up to an extent before that where I started to ask questions and I wanted, I searched for meditation. But um, unfortunately, I was already 29 years old in my life. So I spent quite a lot of my life without any awareness, without any practice, without even self-awareness or knowing myself. But I was spending a lot of time in nature and in nature I was just being silent and I started doing things like just sitting in nature and just like being a rock or you know, just standing in nature in amongst the trees and just like being a tree. And I would think, if I was a tree in this forest, what would I be experiencing? Kind of funny, childish little things. Nobody taught me to do it, but it just made me think and made me act that way. And then I thought, I think I'm meditating. So then I thought, okay, I'll go find someone to meditate. Actually, Vipassana kind of came to me. I didn't know what was meditation, I didn't know what was vipassana, but by my good karma, vipassana was the first practice that came to me. And uh, I believe that's because in my past lives, somewhere, somehow, I had already practiced. So it's parami, it's the, the practices that I've done in past lives that have brought me to this. So it wasn't actually a conscious decision that I was going to practice this path or this, it's what I've done in the past, the conditions of the past, mixed with the conditions of the present, made this a ripen or a ar arise. Yeah. So it was not a conscious choice. It was the conditions of the moment. <laughs> but I'm very happy with this path. So I continue this path. Anybody else? Any comments? On, uh, yes. I just want to talk about what I appreciated about the um, eating meditation activity. Um, I guess living in um, a developing city like Malaysia, it's always super busy, everyone's always working. Um, there's not much time for yourself. And because um, and like food is a constant, it's always there. But um, sitting down and taking the time to actually look at what we're eating and identify what's going into our bodies and um, it sort of made us practice gratitude which I think is super important and is one of my New Year's resolutions to um, be more grateful for everything that I have like even what you said about um, walking down the stairs and um, telling yourself like health like chanting to yourself health and happiness like that's also practicing gratitude that you have legs they were able to walk around and get around and um, I guess when we were yeah eating and meditating while we we're eating um, yeah it sort of slowed us down enough to be able to practice being thankful for the food that we have whatever it is and yeah I feel like yeah, it was pretty special and we should do that more often. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you very much for sharing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Regarding passion, um, so I've been like jogging for three times a week and I think I've done this like a few months ago. Um, but nowadays I feel like I, I've lost passion, you know, like I feel like, you know what, like I just I woke up, I don't feel like I want to go anymore. So it's an experience that is really like different from what I usually have. So, so to clarify, um, does it mean that, you know, I'll have to maybe do some other form of exercise that could spice things up? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Try to do something different, even going walking or doing maybe a fast walk or go to a different place, walk in a different place, jog in a different place. Um, as I said, get a friend, 
to inspire you. And you know, when your friend you know comes around or messages you and says, "Hey, we're going walking or we're going jogging," you kind of go, "Okay." So you know that that does inspire you and does、um, give you a little bit more motivation to do things as well. So yeah, and maybe try something else like cycling or yeah. So spice it up a bit. And maybe you could go skating or something、mm. that is. Why not? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, make it more interesting, because that's what I find when I'm not motivated to do something. It's because I'm actually not really interested in it. Maybe I'm bored with it. Maybe I've done it too many times. It feels repetition, or I'm forcing myself to do it.、Um, so then I need some. I need to be creative and find some、uh, find some other way to do it, and even trick myself into doing it. Let's say I was in the same situation where I feel bored of jogging. But I still have like it's a requirement. I, I still have to do the exact same thing、um, at the same time, like every like three times a week. Example: How would you, is there a way to not become bored of something without changing anything? <laughs> okay, so boredom is not the problem. It looks like a problem, but if you accept the boredom and you surrender to the boredom and you say, "Okay, I'm just going to do this, but I'm going to be bored." And you just go, okay, whatever. I'm going to be bored. I've done this in meditation. It's one of the reasons why many people stop meditating, because they say it's boredom, boring. Actually, when you try to teach it to youth and teenagers, especially, meditation is dead boring. So, yeah, they really, they really, really find it's boring. Actually, the meditation is not boring. They are boring. <laughs> the boredom is in them. It's not in the meditation. The meditation can actually be extremely interesting if you have the right attitude. But they've got the wrong attitude because they're so used to being stimulated by so many things that if they sit down and sit still for even a few minutes, they say it's boring. There's not enough, not enough stimuli. But if you look into boredom and you even ask yourself, what is boredom? What is the nature of boredom? Why does boredom arise? Why does boredom stop me from doing what I want to do? And what's wrong with this anyway? What's this mental state? So, if you look into boredom and you understand what is boredom, if you get interested in boredom, then there were it, interest is the opposite of boredom. So, if you become interested in boredom, then boredom has disappeared and it's been replaced by interest. So. That's a tricky little. That's a little mind hack. There, get interested in boredom. Hmm. <laughs> that's. Hmm. Because hmm. you see, like.、Um, okay. For me,、um, basically, yeah. I said before, I okay.、Uh, full backstory, like I have a YouTube channel. Me and my brother run it. We have like six hundred k subscribers.、Um, the. I there's a lot of work to be done every day, and I'm really passionate about doing this work. Where, but there's like a same number of steps every single time when I create an animation. That, for example, there's the scripting, the storyboarding, then there's like a line art coloring, a video editing. It's all、um, a requirement of steps which basically don't really change every single time. Right. Like I can't do anything to change what. It will do because I have to. Is I would say it will get、uh, repetitive, but I would rather it not get repetitive. Like I would, I would rather the best scenario I love to have is to do it and not be bored of it, or not not feel demotivated or burnt out after a long time of doing it. Because、um, I would love to keep working and working and working without feeling tired. But I yeah, I'm so I'm trying to find a way to do that. <laughs> okay, so boredom is also coming from thoughts. Like I said about being tired, you're telling yourself that you're tired. When you get bored, you start telling yourself that you're bored. And when you keep telling yourself this is boring, this is boring, then what is it? It's just boring. So you're telling yourself what it is, and that's what you're actually creating. So, yes, it's repetitious, but it's you can decide in your mind whether you're going to call it boring or whether you're going to call it interesting. Actually, you can never do the same thing twice. It's impossible. 
no matter what you do, if you draw a perfect circle on the page, which you can't do because circles are not perfect, but if you draw another one and you say, oh, it's the same as the other one, it's actually impossible. This one cannot be that one. So everything is new. Everything is fresh. When you start to think in that way, then you stop thinking, oh, this is boring, I've done this a thousand times, it's the same thing, it can't be the same thing, it can never be the same thing. This breath is not the same as the last breath. This heartbeat is not the same as the last heartbeat. This thought is not the same as the last thought. So remind yourself, everything is new, everything is fresh, this is changing. That also can help to freshen your mind. So it's like changing your mindset? Yep, change your attitude. Yep. And even accepting and just going, yeah, okay, part of this work that I have to do is going to be boring. I have to do this, I have to do step one, and I have to do step two, and three, and four. Maybe you can give it to somebody else to do. Once and show somebody else how to do it, you put out the, the layout and you show somebody else because mm. you're busy. You've got 600 cases of subscribers. You've got other <laughs> things to do. You're an important man. Give these, <laughs> these baby tasks to somebody else to do, you know, let them get bored. You go on with your creativity because you're a very creative guy. Instead of you do the, the blueprints or the, the outlines and let everybody else, let somebody else do the, the coloring in or the other bits and pieces. I don't know exactly what you do, but I'm <laughs> trying to help. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Because, I mean, delegate. Eventually, sometimes I'll feel like I have to force myself to do it because there are deadlines. There are deadlines for these. Yeah. Um, so then, how do I don't feel like I'm forcing myself to do it? It's just thoughts. Mm. It's, it's all thought. So if you bypass the thought and the thought that this is boring or the thought, oh, I've got a deadline or I can't do this or, you know, blah, blah, blah. They're all just thoughts. If you bypass the thoughts and you just come back to what you're doing, it's the same thing as I said. If you, if you wanted to walk up one of, these, one of the, tow the towers and you're walking up the stairs, how many stairs is it? It must be over a thousand stairs or more to walk from the bottom to the top of one of these huge towers that you have in the city here. So if you're thinking, oh, I've done that much, oh, I've got that much to go, then you're going to be tired. So you create tiredness for yourself. But if you just stay in the moment, let go of the thoughts, then you won't be tired. Potentially, you could just keep drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing. And drawing. Potentially. Theoretically. But of course, you need to take a break, but take a break before you get tired. So it's like being in the present will help you? Yep. Bypass the thoughts that are creating the problems, creating the boredom, creating the tiredness. It's all just thinking. It's all just thoughts. Okay, thank you. Thank You're you so welcome. Much. Thanks. I think that helps a lot of people here, actually. We all get in these situations in life. We may not be under the pressure that he's under, but we all have situations in, in life where we are telling ourselves that um, we don't have enough energy, we don't have enough time, and all these things, and we pressure ourselves. So we can bypass that by the thoughts and just get on with the work. Just do the work. Lucky you're not slaves and that you're not being beaten on your back and forced to do these things. You, you, many of you actually paid good money to do these things and you have an income from doing these things. So you should be actually very happy and grateful that you have a job, that you have this opportunity and that you can do this work and that your mind is working, your body's working. So you step into a, a state of gratitude for for now no it's okay you're next you're right go ahead so you step into gratitude instead of um resistance so that's the other thing that you're experiencing he's experiencing resistance when he's dr drawn so many frames and done so many things at some point he starts to resist what he's doing so resistance is one of the biggest things that you can see in your life. If you can turn resistance into acceptance, you'll change almost everything in your life. It's absolutely transformational. When you see resistance, 
it's almost like a switch in your mind. You can switch resistance to acceptance. Even you just say to yourself, okay, I accept, I surrender. All right, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to draw. I'm just going to shut up and I'm going to draw. I'm going to shut up and I'm going to walk up these stairs. I'm just going to walk up the stairs. I surrender. I don't surrender and give up. I surrender. I surrender the argument in my head because it's a waste of time. I have to do this work. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to switch off this if you can. Or you can replace your thoughts with a mantra. So we spoke about a mantra earlier. A mantra is the repetition of words or sounds that actually blocks out all other thoughts. I'll give you a quick mantra. My most favorite mantra is the Metta mantra. The Metta mantra. And basically it says, may I be safe, peaceful, and healthy. Very simple, very lovely. Metta means loving kindness. It's the Buddha's teaching on universal, unconditional love. May I be safe, peaceful, and healthy. Would you like to be safe? You like being safe? We're very lucky here. We're pretty safe. It's a pretty safe city and a pretty safe country. Yeah, there's some bad things going here and there. And the news puts it up and then everybody gets scared. But it's actually, it happens to like 1% of the population or even less. So don't let the media scare you. Live where you are and spread loving kindness where you are. The more you put out loving kindness, the more it's going to come back to you. So you don't have to be afraid. You can make yourself strong. May I be safe? Would you like to be peaceful? Peaceful is nice, isn't it? It's better than stressful. It's better than worryful, fearful, angryful. May I be peaceful and healthy. Nobody wants to be sick, of course. So, may I be safe, peaceful, and healthy. And we keep it in that order. Safe in your body and mind, free from danger. Peaceful is the state of mind. And healthy is the body. Even you can have a healthy mind as well. Safe, peaceful, and healthy. And you bless yourself. Bless yourself first. When you can't sleep at night, you just say, may I be safe, peaceful, and healthy. Go into the lying meditation posture that we did today. May I be safe, peaceful, and healthy. May I be safe. The reason you can't sleep is because your mind's too busy. And it's going over all that worldly stuff that probably doesn't really matter anyway. So just say to yourself, repeat the metta mantra. May I be safe, peaceful, and healthy. May I be safe, peaceful, and healthy. Nice, soft, calming voice like you're talking to a little puppy dog or a little baby or something. May I be safe, peaceful, and healthy. May I be safe, peaceful, and healthy. And bless yourself. Who else is going to come along and say, may you be safe, peaceful, and healthy? <laughs> Not many people are going to do that. But you do it for yourself. Don't wait for somebody else to do this. Don't wait for somebody else to love you. You love yourself first. You accept yourself, you love yourself. And then, when you start to feel it and you feel, ah, oh, I am safe, I am peaceful, I am healthy. Ah, oh, may my mother be safe, peaceful and healthy. May my father, my sister, my brother, my partner, my, my daughter, my son, my friend, my lover, my boyfriend, girlfriend, my whoever. May my, my, my cat, my dog, my goldfish, my my neighbor, my, the, the noisy, disturbing neighbor next door. May you be safe, peaceful, and healthy. And you will find that everything starts to change because you change your attitude. And even when you have to do a, a repetitive task, you can actually keep your mind busy by doing the, the metta mantra. You can use it while you're driving. You can use it while you're working out on a working out machine or while you're swimming or jogging or walking or other things. So it's metta mantra. May I be safe, peaceful and healthy. And then I can say, may you be safe, peaceful and healthy. May we be safe, peaceful and healthy. May all my friends be safe, peaceful and healthy. May all beings in BGF be safe, peaceful and healthy. May all beings in, in um, Selangor be safe, peaceful and healthy. May all beings in, in Malaysia be safe, peaceful and healthy. 
and you can spread it out. May all beings in this world be safe, peaceful, and healthy. May all beings everywhere in all forms of existence be safe, peaceful, and healthy. So you're opening up your heart from yourself, you open it up to yourself, and you open up your heart, and then you start to share it with others. And it's unconditional loving kindness. So by repeating a mantra, you can block out other thoughts. Yeah, um, thanks for the sharing. Actually, just now you mentioned the karma. Also, I feel like um, I was in this path also due to karma because of my illness. You know, I try to uh, do something about the headaches of my illness in the past, and then I. I, I try to do the breathing meditations mm. and then ask around and see some books. Then after day in and day out, you know, uh, during my, my secondary school, then be quite mindful on the breathing. And then after about one year, then the illness uh, disappear. But actually in, in the general stage, my body energy is quite low. Yeah. And um, okay, so after my 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 health is getting better. Then I didn't practice carry on <laughs> for the the breathing exercise, and and somehow after m many years, more than ten or twenty years, I I um come come close to the Zen practice. They they teach about don't know my, and I'm quite inspiring. Just now you 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 mentioned in the very earlier, you know, we don't know. What will is mm. going to happen? Mm. So it's linked to the Zen Dono Mai. The Dono Mai is go, go, going to the origin, the yep. zero. Yep. You know, they they point point always point to the emptiness. Yeah, and then somehow because the Zen teachings are very simple and brief, they don't do a lot of explanations. They do a lot of practice, but um, this mind is also quite curious. And then uh, five years ago, I come across to the Vipassana, uh, the teachings also from Brahma, uh, um, Dejania, different mm. type of school. Um, I quite, you know, um, found, I do learn more about the mechanism, how it works of the mind. Yeah. And apart from the, 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 the learnings, um, my body state actually recently uh, still not quite stable, especially my arms have pain uh, for last uh, last month. Mm. So I do sometimes feel like you know that's kind of kind of karma. But this kind of karma also is sometimes a good teacher for us to learn. But when it's overwhelming, it's oh, you know most of the time it's pain numb and then even sitting it disturbed my, my, my meditations yeah. so I need uh, to learn back the uh, samadhi way because I don't carry on the breathing exercise for a long time yeah. so I, I the sound you mentioned uh, you learn the um, rising and falling the what do you call that yeah. Mahasi Mahasi yeah, yeah. Also, I want to uh, get some uh, skills or technique from you. What is the difference from uh, breathing and rising fallings? And what is the technique you can teach us? Because last time I do rising and falling, actually, I feel it can help for the energies, especially for, uh, for the, the whole body mm. to moving the chi, especially. Mm. So I, I would like to, you know, uh, your advice on that. Mm -hmm. And also, just now you mentioned about the five spiritual faculties. Mm. Uh, the school I learned uh, about, the f the f some of the definitions is slightly different, but I found very interesting. And when you, 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 you mentioned about the faith, it's related to interesting. Where is um, Dejanya? You mentioned the interest, which to learn is related to wisdom. It's different category, but somehow, there's connections because some somehow we say five spectra spiritual faculty actually is five but actually it's one the whole thing come together it happened one together but we try to con con conceptualize speaking then it could be you know you can group this or that there's a link 
I do learn something on that. Also, you mentioned about the quantum physics. I also very interested, interested in that recently because um, in quantum, it can exist everywhere. There is no time. There is no space. We actually, you know, it's everywhere. When we there is observations, it become a particle. It's there already. It's limited ourselves. So this is a great, great uh, facts found in the in the in the modern science. It's actually uh, telling with the 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 Buddhism uh, theory or or or, or their, their their sutra. Yep. So I great you know you can share all this and then uh, I feel very happy on you know to meet you. Beautiful, thank, thank you. you. I'm happy to meet you too. Um, <clears throat> Your main question, though, was uh, what's the difference between observing the breath and the rising and falling of the abdomen? Actually, there's no... Yes, they, they will give you different experiences. They can lead you down a, a different path. It depends on... The main thing is that you find a teacher. If you find a teacher that teaches your breath at the nostrils, then follow that teacher and follow the breath at the nostrils. If you find a teacher that's doing the rising and falling of the abdomen, then follow the teacher that, and do the rising and falling of the abdomen. So it's not about this is better than that or whatever. This will give you some different experience. That will give you some other different experience. The main thing is that you have faith and confidence in the teacher. If you believe in the teacher and you believe in the technique, then you will develop some, some, you will get something from that. So I don't believe that you need to go back to samatha. Um, I believe that you need to observe what are the obstructions to your, um, in your mind. You said something was a distraction. And what I'd like to say is that in vipassana, there are no distractions. There are only new objects of awareness. So in someone else also earlier mentioned that something was a distraction. Uh, the drumming, for example, downstairs, it was a distraction. But actually in Vipassana, there are no distractions. It's if the drumming happens, now drumming is, hearing the drumming is your object of awareness. If you're resisting the drumming, then resistance becomes your object of awareness. So whatever it is that is a distraction, you take that as your object of awareness, but then you check, how do I feel about this? And that's where you find your suffering. That's where you find the dukkha, is because you're resisting what you're experiencing. So when a pain comes up in the body, you said you have arm pain, and you know, there might be some remedy for it, there might be some way to relieve it, but it is happening because of karma. There's a reason why you are experiencing arm pain. So it's not that you have to get rid of the arm pain, but you have to see how is your mind reacting to the arm pain and start to accept the way that your mind is reacting. And when you do that, your, the resistance will calm down, your mind will calm down. When your mind calms down, your body calms down. When the body calms down, it can actually heal itself. So the way you healed yourself previously, by doing the breathing meditation, it's also part of the way of getting out of the way of the natural healing process. All of our bodies will heal themselves perfectly if you get out of the way. There are some really good teachings about this. One man that I would like to mention to you all, uh, you can find him on the internet. His name is Joe Dispenza. Joe Dispenza. He's using quantum teachings and now incorporating meditations and some spiritual teachings. It's not Buddhist, but like you said, and as I know, Many of the modern teachings, especially scientific realizations, they're actually catching up with the Buddha who taught these things 2,500, 600 years ago, had no technical equipment, but had a perfectly clear penetrative mind 
who could see exactly what is happening in the body and mind. The Buddha taught all about atoms and all about, actually, not in the same way as we understand or hear it, but the Buddha was teaching quantum also. So scientists now, with their equipment, have actually found out ways to even verify what the Buddha was teaching. Many things that, the, that Einstein spoke about was with regard to, to Buddhism, and even Einstein said himself, if there's any religion that's going to fit in with modern science, it would be Buddhism. Because Buddhism is actually not a religion. It's more of a science than it is a religion. And it's practical. It's actually it's giving you, the Buddha is giving us ways to practice. It's not just, oh yes, I believe in the Buddha and oh, the Buddha's going to save me one day and if I you know, say the name of the Buddha a hundred thousand times, I'm going to go to heaven and blah, blah, blah. That's not what the Buddha was teaching. The Buddha was teaching even those things that I was talking about, the mindfulness, the concentration, that will arise in the wisdom. The wisdom will transform your mind. You yourself become a Buddha. Not exactly a Buddha, but you can become enlightened. You save yourself. You free yourself from suffering. It's not a matter of, oh, if I just become a Buddhist, I'll become free from suffering. So it's about working on it yourself. But be careful that you don't work too hard. Because many people do this, they push themselves into meditation. They even push themselves to become Buddhist or something else. And that's not what you have to do. You can take the principles, apply them, but apply them steadily. Apply them um, equally and evenly and have a balanced and level form of energy. And then... Um, and that's why I said today, I want you to also learn how to relax yourself and not be so perfectionist, not be so pushy, not so um, hard on yourself. Many people are very hard on themselves, even to the point where they're criticizing themselves, judging, blaming themselves, even punishing themselves, hating themselves because they're not fast enough, they're not beautiful enough, they're not skinny enough, they're not you know, good enough, they're not whatever enough, then they're beating themselves up and that's useless. You're just going round and round in circles and you're not going to make forward progress. You have to see what habits that you have in your mind and what is keeping you going around in circles. Once you break those habits, now you can start moving forward. And the Buddha's teaching, the Noble Eightfold Path, is called a path because it goes forward. It's not called the Noble Eightfold Circle. <laughs> it's, it's not an eightfold circle that just goes round and round in circles and just does the same thing repeatedly. It's called the Noble Eightfold Path because it leads to Nibbana. It leads to enlightenment. It leads to freedom. So... Finishing up on the Noble Eightfold Path is a pretty good place to finish, I think. Um, isn't it amazing how six hours passes? Can you believe it that we've been here for six hours? I know I talked a lot, and you might only think that I talked a lot, but we did silent sitting meditation a couple of times. We did our silent eating meditation. We did our silent lying meditation and followed by a silent sitting meditation. So... I'd just like to recap and say that um, although it looks like I talked a lot here and I feel like I talked a lot, we also did our silent periods today. I hope you picked up some, some points. And one of my main points is that, and I just made it just now, don't be too hard on yourself. Don't push yourself too hard, especially in meditation. In life, We've often, and I know that in your culture, you are very much pushed by your teachers, by your parents, by society, by even the whole family in general. Sometimes it feels like all your ancestors are watching you and saying, you know, you have to be a good, you know, ancestor. And then, you know, you're working for the next generations and, you know, you have to be, 
You have to be good, you have to work hard, you're not just working for yourself, you're working for the whole family and all these things. So you can feel a lot of pressure on yourself. And that's okay, we still respect that. But you also come back to yourself, your own energy, your own feelings, your own aspirations. And I believe that if you follow your heart, and you do what you believe is right, you will naturally be fulfilling the expectations of ancestors, of your parents, and you will also then equally be um, helping your children and the future generations. So this lineage will flow equally well, even if you don't push yourself, force yourself, and create stress for yourself, because you know that's actually what you're doing. You're stressing yourselves. And there's nothing in the teaching that says you have to stress yourself. Stressing yourself is only creating more suffering and probably more resistance. And especially in meditation, it's not the way to practice. In the world, we've been taught, work hard, strive hard, do your best, achieve everything, become famous, become rich, become successful, become everything. In meditation and on a spiritual path and this Buddhist Noble Eightfold Path, there's no such teaching. In fact, it's more relax, be present, switch your mind on, be fully alert, be fresh, be clear, check your intentions, why am I doing this? What am I doing this for? What is my reason for doing this? And following your heart. What do I really love to do? If you follow your heart, that's like having that faith. When you have faith and you find what you really want to do, the energy will come, the mindfulness comes, the concentration comes, and the wisdom comes. And you will find your flow in your life. So that's it. That's our little workshop for today, or our retreat, I think it was called. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I also call sadhu, sadhu. I call sadhu to you for your practice and for turn, even just turning up today was quite wonderful. There are lots of, like I said, there are a lot of possibilities that you could have done today, especially you young guys, you know, you could have been off doing uh, lots of other things, not to mention the older guys here, older people, you could have been busy doing a lot of other things, but you decided to bring yourself here today. So I call sadhu to you, and I also call sadhu to myself, because um, what I did today was really good, and I appreciate it in myself. I appreciate that which I have learned from my teachers. I appreciate uh, my teachers for what they've shared and who they are. And then I appreciate myself and I appreciate my own practice and I appreciate what comes through from my practice as well. So I call sadhu to me, I also call sadhu to you. And you can also think about that for yourself. Usually we call sadhu at the end of a talk. You sat and listened to the talk. So you call sadhu to yourself as well. It's good. Sadhu just means like, it's good, it's excellent. And the Buddha's teaching is excellent in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end. So when we say sadhu, 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 we're saying it's excellent, it's excellent. So you also did excellent today. 